Do you want to turn negatives like this into pictures like this? I'm going to show you how to do it on today's episode of Ask David Bergman. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Here I am, as always, answering your photography questions right here on Adorama TV. If you've got a question, you know what to do. Just go to askdavidbergman.com and submit that form on the site. I just might pick your question to answer right here on a future show. I also want to remind you that there are still some spots left for my Shoot from the Pit live concert photography workshops around the world. The North American stadium dates have been incredible, and I'm bringing this once-in-a-lifetime photo event for the first time ever to New Zealand, Australia, Norway, Germany, the Netherlands, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and England. Go to shootfromthepit.com to sign up and get on my free email list to be notified of future events. All right, today's question was sent in by Brenda O, oh, and she wants to know... Hi David, I have a lot of old 35mm negatives that I would like to digitize. I've bought different devices over the years and the process takes too long and the quality is just not worth the time it takes. What do you recommend would be the best way to go about it? Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Brenda, for sending that question in. I've actually received similar versions of it numerous times over the years, but I haven't tackled it on the show because there really wasn't an easy way to do it. Now, I've seen photographers who built do-it-yourself rigs using plumbing supplies and 3D printers and all kinds of crazy systems, but that's really too much hassle for most of us. I'm happy to say that now there are some newer tools to make it easy, and I'm going to show you what I use to digitize my own film. First, let's back up a little bit. As you probably know, throughout most of the history of photography, images were shot on film. And there have been various standard film sizes produced over the years, with 35 millimeter being the most common. Now, you could shoot onto positive film, which was usually mounted and viewed with a projector, or negative film, which was most often used to make larger size prints. Now, I'm going to use those a bit interchangeably today, but we're just talking about film. Now, I shot a lot of slides and negatives early on in my career, and I have boxes of them in storage. Now, whether you're like me and have a huge archive of film, or you're just shooting new images on film today, you probably want to make them into digital files so you can license them, post them, or even print them from your computer without having to use a darkroom. Now, sidebar, even if you digitize every piece of film that you have, I still wouldn't throw away your negatives. Those are your originals and they're important. Scanning technology is going to continue to improve and you might be able to get even better quality in the future. More importantly, styles change also. I have some prints that I made 30 years ago that I thought were perfect at the time. Now I look back at them and they just look dated. Thankfully, I can go back and digitize them or reprint them from the original film to make it look how I want today. So you've got all these pieces or rolls of film. How do you actually go about digitizing them? Well, it used to be that the only way to do it was to use a scanner. There are high-end film scanners used by photo labs, but those are really pretty expensive and made for high-volume jobs. For consumers, you can use a flatbed scanner that has an attachment for film scanning, but honestly, I never really found those to work very well. It was hard to get the film in focus, and the resolution wasn't particularly good. I just was never happy with that. Now, there are dedicated film scanners for small home office or studio use, but they're getting harder to find these days. And you know why? The reason is because it's much easier and often cheaper to use your digital camera to make digital scans of your film. By taking a picture of the film, you're using the high quality sensor in your camera to get great looking files. Now, most of us already have a digital camera. My Canon R5 is 45 megapixels and the quality is amazing. You just need a few more pieces to make this setup work. Now let's look at my rig, which I have right over here. Um, the lens that I'm using is the Canon RF100 macro. Macro lenses allow you to get super close to the film, so you use the entire sensor to fill the frame with your image. If the film is small in your photo because you can't get your lens close enough, then you're going to have to crop a lot and you're going to lose resolution. A little cropping is fine, but the less you have to do, the better. Now be aware that all macro lenses are not created equal. You might have a lens that says macro on it, but a dedicated macro will almost always be better for film scanning. Those usually give you a one-to-one -one ratio. That means that the object you're photographing is the same size in real life as it is on the sensor of your film. I'm using the Canon R5 body right here, which has a full frame sensor. It's the same size as a 35mm 
35 millimeter piece of film, so with a one-to-one -one lens, you can get it close enough and still focus to completely fill the frame with a 35 millimeter piece of film. This Canon RF Macro actually has a 1.4 times magnification, so I can get even closer than that if I want, but I usually prefer to just capture the entire frame all at once. Now to take a picture of the film, you could just hold it up to the sky, you could just hold it in your hand and hold it up to the sky so it's backlit and then take a picture of it, but that's not gonna be very efficient. So there are a couple more items you need to make this work. You need a way to hold your camera, obviously. You can absolutely use a tripod, as long as it gives you the option of pointing your camera straight down. If you're just scanning a few frames and already have a decent tripod, then that's gonna work just fine. But if you want something that's a little bit easier to set up and repeat, you should buy a copy stand. It's simply a base with a post that you can mount your camera on. This is a no-name brand that I've had for a while, but I'm gonna put a link to some good ones down below. So now that the camera is set up, you need something to also hold the film and a way to shine light through it so you can see the image. Like Brenda, I had tried a few different ways to do this, but recently I found a system I really like. Lomography is a company that makes fun film cameras and a bunch of accessories for film photographers. They do make film holders, and if you have your own light table to, to backlight your film, you can just use those for digitizing. But I recently found that they also have two complete kits for scanning film. The Digital Liza Max is made for photographers who want to use their cell phone camera to take pictures of film. Some phones actually do have a macro lens built in, and that might be fine to take a snapshot for social media. But like I said before, you really need a camera and a real macro lens to get the best quality. The Digital Liza Plus is what I use. It comes with a film holder for 35 millimeter and 120 film sizes, and can handle some, a few other sizes as well. It also comes, very cool, with a small light panel, which is powered either by a USB or two AA batteries. The film holder snaps right on top with a couple magnets, and um, I, use a, I used to use a big light box, and I had issues with flare coming from the light around the sides, so I had to create masks to prevent that. The Lomography kit actually comes with a couple masks, like this. This is the 35 millimeter one, and this is a 127 size. Um, so it comes with these masks, and all you do is just snap those on, and you can mask out that light. I prefer to scan the whole piece of film with some of the sprocket holes showing because I think the border is kind of part of the charm of, sh of shooting film in the first place, but that's just a personal choice. This thing even comes with a spirit level right on there already, so you can make sure everything is even and lined up right. This whole kit sells for 75 bucks and is worth every penny. Now when you're ready to scan, all you do is you just take your film like so, and you just feed it in from the side. We've got a little uh, uh, sprocket grabber here on the inside. You just stick it right in there and you turn this in, or in so it slides the film right over. I'm going to bring it right over to a frame right there. We'll snap that on and you just advance to the frame you want. Now I do recommend using a bulb blower to get rid of any dust that might be on this thing because film does gather dust very easily. So you kind of blow one side Upside down, you blow the other side, nice and clean. Snap that right on there, and there you go. Um, you should also be using gloves when you're handling negatives, but uh, do as I say, not as I do. I'm just being sloppy about it here today. Um, now I've already got my camera set. It's as low as I need to, as I can get it, so that I can fill the frame with my image. Um, as for camera settings, I am on daylight white balance, but I'm shooting raw and I'm gonna adjust color after I've got the photo in my computer. Um, you want your ISO to be as low as you can go for the highest quality image possible. Uh, I'm at 100 on my R5 here. For aperture, you should have some depth of field in case your film isn't completely flat, which it rarely is. Um, I use the sweet spot of my lens, which is around two to three stops closed down from wide open. This is actually a 2.8 lens, so I'm shooting at 7.1. And then I just adjust shutter speed as needed for each frame to get a good exposure. If you're not sure what your exposure should look like on a negative, you can go ahead and bracket, so that way you'll be covered either way. Now this lens has amazing autofocus, so I'm gonna just use that. If you prefer to manual focus, maybe you're using an older lens, just turn on focus peaking so that you can see when the image is sharp. You should try to focus on the grain. The, look for the film grain and that's what you wanna focus on. Now this negative I've got here that's in there right now is 25 years old. 
I took pictures outside of a temple in Japan right before the 1998 Olympics started in Nagano. I was covering my first Olympics and I had never been to Japan, so I went out and did some sightseeing before it was time to get to work. I was already shooting early digital cameras for the Miami Herald at that time, but the team from KRT in Nagano wanted everything on film. So I have some digital scans from back then, but you can bet that the quality I get right here today in my studio is so much better than those old film cameras in 1998. Now, because the shutter speed is pretty slow, in this case, it's gonna be two seconds, I like to use either a cable release, a separate cable release, or the self timer on the camera, so it takes the picture a couple seconds after I touch the button. I'll also usually sometimes, usually sometimes, I will tether the camera to my computer. I've got a video about tethering planned for the future, but that's gonna allow me to see the images right away without touching the camera. I can trigger and I can get the images in there right away. You also should turn off the lights in the room so you don't affect the color or get any flare from the overheads. Now I'm not gonna do that now, but I shot this image a bit earlier and this is what the full frame looks like straight out of the camera. Now after you've done that, the final step is to convert your negative into a positive in the computer. Now there are a few ways to do it. I think the most common is by using a piece of software called Negative Lab Pro. It only works with Lightroom and costs 99 bucks after a free trial after your first 12 images. Now, I don't use Lightroom, I prefer Capture One, and there's a neat tool for Capture One called Analog Toolbox, but you can also just do the conversion manually by opening your levels panel and reversing the white and black sliders. You push white all the way over to where the black normally is, and the black to where the white normally is. You can bring them back a little bit to adjust exposure, but that's how to turn a negative into a positive. Then you can adjust things like color balance, but be aware that many of your sliders are gonna work in opposite directions because you've got everything flipped. Now, if you don't use either of those methods, Lomography has a free online tool called the Lomo Digital Liza Lab. Um, there's also a good standalone program called Film Lab, and new software is coming out all the time. Now, you can use either of those to get your negatives flipped, but you're still probably gonna bring them into Photoshop or Lightroom or Capture One to fine tune your, your image to your style. After working on my temple photo a bit, here is what the final picture looks like. Now, as always, I'm gonna put a link to all the hardware and software I've talked about in the description below. I know I threw a lot at you here today, but this process used to be really challenging and there wasn't a good off-the-shelf system to digitize negatives. With a good macro lens and the Digital Liza kit, scanning your film has become pretty easy and is accessible to almost everyone. How are you all scanning your film right now? Have you used a setup like I've got here? Let me know down in the comments below. While you're there, do me a favor and like, subscribe, and click that bell icon so you get notifications. Check out my Shoot From The Pit workshops, and I hope to see you on the road somewhere out there this year. Thanks for watching. I'm going to be back next time with another question right here on Ask David Bergman.